Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from inside the fish. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Can we give them a standing ovation, everybody? We just want to honor you, moms. We just want to thank you. Come on. Blessing, blessing, blessing. <laughs> well, thank you, moms, and everyone for choosing to worship with us. We're honored to have you. You got the best job on the planet, let me just say. And so, you know, one thing's true that, you know, without Jesus, where would be? Where would we be? And without moms. And if you can't figure that out, you can ask someone older later, all right? We wouldn't be here without you. That's true. Uh, but you do have the best job on the planet. We are grateful. And uh, one of the things I just want to say is you don't realize the impact you have on your kids, your spouse, your family, your neighbors, really anyone you come in touch with. You just have a tremendous impact. And we're so blessed at Westridge to have so many great moms. And uh, so for all of you out there, those of you online, happy Mother's Day. We're blessed that you were here with us. Um, happy Mother's Day to my mom. She's, uh, she usually tunes in right around this service, so she's probably joining us. Uh, in Crestline, maybe not now because we're hours behind, but she'll join us, if not live, sometime soon. So happy Mother's Day, Mom. And uh, so we're just, uh, we're just blessed to have all of you. And um, so anyway, uh, my mom just wants to say thank you. So I'll show her my kicks. She bought these kicks for me. So Mom bought those. Those are cool. But the cool thing is, is she, it's not so much the shoes. Uh, she sent them to a guy who does the Lakers shoes. Like he does all the like, you know, the cool events or like movements or causes they do and they write on their shoes and you're wondering like, how do they do that? Well, she found the guy that does that for the Lakers and she had to, so she put Westridge on here. We got the logo Westridge and love God, love people. There you go. So cool kick. So, all right. So thank you, mom. Again, happy Mother's Day. And if you join now as a member for $300, you can have, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I had to pull it in there. Just, just playing. Um, well, again, happy Mother's Day. Uh, we just want to honor you. In fact, right after service, we've got Brewster's for you. We have uh, a photo booth for you to set up there just to take some snapshots and some memories with your family. Uh, just want to honor you, have some fun with you. So we'll, we'll take some pictures with you. You can eat some ice cream. And, and the kids are having, uh, I saw a lot of kids with cotton candy and ice cream. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. But it's going to be a fun day. It's going to be a really fun Mother's Day. So they should have lots of energy when they get home. Uh, so they can, they can do everything, chores, everything. They can just hammer it out for you. All right. Uh, well, uh, also, I want to let you know, and so I haven't really uh, gave you much information, but we have a serve day coming up every fifth Sunday. We have a fifth Sunday at the end of May here. And so we've got a serve day coming up, and I'm excited to let you know we're doing a packathon. And so I know we did some packing last uh, the last time we did a serve day, and uh, we learned we could do a lot more. So we are packing 20 thousand meals on on serve day so get ready we're gonna have we're gonna have some help i have i have uh, feed the hungers coming so these are twenty thousand meals for kids some of them will be going over to ukraine moldova poland uh some will be going to haiti but uh, they have a great ministry where they just feed kids and uh, so what you will we'll pack and we'll pack them in boxes so just so you know every box we pack is enough food for a child for a kid for the whole school year and so that's, that's what we're going to be doing. So we have, we'll have that going on. So we need 100 people to serve and kids, uh, you know, uh, younger kids and adults, we can all pack. And so we'll have a staff member here from Feed the Hunger to help us do that. Uh, they, they do a really good job. So they're going to make sure we're efficient and we can pack 20,000. In fact, I told them we can, we'll pack up to 25,000. We got a, we got a great team. And so, uh, so they're ready for that. And um, so uh, we're excited about that. And then we'll be going back to Grace Church as well. So if you want to pack, you can pack. If you want to go serve, if you're a part of Grace Church, we're going to be serving over at Grace Church as well that day. And so that's coming up at the end of the month. So more details for that to come. But I'm excited for that. Um, Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. That's where we're at. Uh, for those of you that are new with us, maybe, or if you're new online or you're new in service, we started the series of Jonah last week. And uh, really, we just read chapter one, we went through, and so much happened in one chapter. It really was remarkable. But if you missed last week, we kind of shared a little bit of history. Uh, we shared, you know, why, you know, a lot of times when we say Jonah, all you think of is fish, right? That's all you think about is this, he got swallowed by a fish, all the child's books, it's a bestseller out there, right? Uh, but I shared a little bit of history of like, Jonah wasn't just running away from God. There was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. Uh, there was a, uh, a dictatorship that was really, really, uh, really aggressive and nasty towards the Jews. 
uh, the Assyri Assyrians. And uh, so when God said go to Nineveh, he wasn't just saying, hey, you know, go have a party at Nineveh. Go talk to those people over there. I like them. These were the enemy of the Jews. These were the enemies of Israel. So it wasn't an easy, and no other prophet up until this time had ever went into a Gentile nation and preached and taught as God had instructed him. So this is the first time that a Jew would leave Israel. Now, a lot of the prophets of those days would go to Israel or to the Israeli kings or to the Jews. Uh, this is the first time they're going to a Gentile nation and preaching and teaching to the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, we sit here in 2022, you know, we know about Paul and how he went to the Gentiles and all that. But this is the first time in Old Testament that a prophet is going to Nineveh to preach uh, this amazing message that God's going to give. So, of course, Jonah has a little timid. There's a lot of tension there, uh, a lot of concern. And so he flees, he fled. And so that's what we learned last week is he went to Tarshish. This is a city south of Spain and South Spain. And so he got on a boat uh, got on the boat, and, uh, and all of a sudden there was a storm that came, uh, and the sailors of the boat, now these were, these were religious people, right? They, they worshipped a lot of different gods, not the true God, but they worshipped gods, so they were, they were pagan in, in their sense of, of, but they prayed, and they cried out to their gods, and, and this storm came, and they cast lots, you know, that was something they did a lot in those days, they cast lots, and they, they found out that the reason why this storm is here was because of Jonah. Now, Jonah had told them, I'm a prophet of God, uh, and I'm running away from God. He had told them, he got on the boat, he went downstairs, went to sleep in the belly of the boat, and so the and so sailors cast lots and said, hey, this is because of Jonah, we need to go wake him up. They went and woke him up. They said, Jonah, what did you do? What did you do to make God so angry to send this storm? And so they took Jonah up, and Jonah said, hey, look, it's my fault. I'm running from God. It's my fault. I'm the prophet. I'm fleeing from God, and that's why the storm's here. And, he said, and they said, well, how do we get this to stop? And Jonah said, just throw me in the water. Throw me in the sea, and the storm will stop. And the, uh, last week, we shared how uh, the sailors or the people on the boat prayed to Jonah's God and said, hey, we wash our hands. We're going to throw him in. Do not claim us guilty. We're innocent of this man's blood. And so uh, they eventually throw Jonah into the water, and the storm stops. And that's where we ended last week, is they throw him into the water, and a big fish comes and eats Jonah whole. That's where we stopped, right? So that's Jonah. That's the book of Jonah. That's kind of a quick snapshot of what we learned last week. Well, today, uh, I want to share a little bit about, and a lot of times when we get fo focused on Jonah, we think about Jonah, whether you're new to the Bible or maybe you've heard of the story, uh, because it is a very popular story. I also shared with you last week, this isn't just some fictional story. This is a real story. Even though we're calling this a fishy tale and a faithful God, it wasn't just a tale in the sense of what we know as of today where it's some story that never happened. This is real life. Jonah got swallowed by a fish. God sent the fish. God spoke to Jonah. He told this prophet to go to Nineveh. This is a real life story. It's not just some fabricated fictional thing uh, that you just hear uh, from some storybook. This is a, a real incident that happened to Jonah, and he's sharing about this moment, and he's sharing about what's happening. And so, uh, again, a lot of times we get focused on the fish, but let me just tell you, look, don't focus so much on the fish. Now, I'll talk about the fish a little bit today, but don't get so focused on the fish because really, in ancient, ancient Hebrew, this is just a form of Uber. <laughs> it's just a form of Uber. It's taking Jonah from here to there, right? 20,000 years from now, we'll look back and go, Uber, what was that, right? So God is using this fish to take Jonah from Tarshish or on his way to Tarshish to get him back to Nineveh. That's what he's using. He's just using the fish as transportation. Now, Jonah obviously doesn't know how this is all going to happen. And so how many of you have ever asked that question? In fact, uh, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in Jonah chapter 2. I'm going to read this in a second. Uh, but how many of you have wondered, like, how did he live in the belly of a fish? I don't know what kind of fish it was, but how did he survive? How did he live? Uh, well, I've got like three options. And so uh, by the way, these aren't like, these aren't gospel. These are open-handed conversations, okay? So this isn't the gospel, so please don't make a new church, Jonah's church, that's divided and separated because of what your option is. But let me give you three options that, that possibly or could be. And by the way, uh, nobody knows except for God uh, how, how, the, how he survived. Uh, but let me give you three ideas or three thoughts. And you can have fun with this in your life groups today. You can, you know, vote your choice or your best one. Or maybe you have a whole different option. It's fine, all right? It's fine. Um, but first is, maybe there is a fish that could swallow you whole and you could live in for three days and three nights. Possibly, right? 
Obviously, it happened. Possibly, there is a fish in the ocean today that could swallow us whole, and we could survive for an uh, amount of days. That, that is a possible solution. I'm not sure, but uh, Jonah lived, and so possibly that, that could be a scenario. Second is maybe God supernaturally sustained his life. Maybe God supernaturally sustained Jonah in the belly of the fish. Miraculously, that just happened. And obviously, that, that could be a true statement as well, right? So that's one, another option. And thirdly is, maybe Jonah died and God brought him back to life. Now, that's a minority option or opinion, but let me just say that uh, the reason why this would be an opinion or maybe would be an option because in Matthew it's gospel. Jesus speaking, by the way, uh, chapter 12, verse 40, it says, For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Noah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. He's speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of those. But so... Just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, God could be speaking literally. It was literally three days and three nights. So just like literally three days and three nights. Or God could be saying, just like Jonah died in the belly of the fish and I vomited him out back to new life, the Son of Man will come out of the grave after three days and three nights. So again, don't beat each other up which option, you know, this isn't about the, the bloods over here and the crypts over here. That's not, we're not getting into all that, all right? So, but just whatever your opinion is, is fine. But, but I, I don't know about you, but I just like to think about those things. How did he do it? So those are, those are a few options. Let's read Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And then I want, just wanted to share some things with you. Starting in verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the, to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead. And the Lord, and you heard me. You threw me into the ocean's depths, and then I sank into the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O Lord, you've driven me from your presence, yet I look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O Lord God, my God, Snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remember the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you and your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with a song of praise or thanksgiving, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit wrong translation, vomit Jonah out onto the beach. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty graphic. Jonah is writing, and this is why we spoke last week about Jonah is the author. He's telling you what this experience was like, and really what you're going to see today, and this is what we're going to learn, is some nuggets about our prayer life. Jonah begins to pray. He begins to pray. But let's just be real. How many of you are there any germaphobes out here? Anyone? Come on, my Purell people. You, would you like living in the belly of a fish? Some of you, how many of you even like touching fish? Yuck. The smell of fish. I mean, for us germaphobes, that would be the worst situation. I'm in the belly of this stinky, smelly fish. And by the way, he's probably not the only person thing in the belly. So for us, we're like Purellin, like all the time, right? Imagine being that in the belly of the fat, that'd be the worst. How about anyone afraid of the dark? Complete and utter darkness for three days and three nights. Complete, utter darkness. Could you imagine living like you can't just reach up and pull the light string on the whale belly, right? It doesn't work that way. It's dark. It's smelly, it's stinky, there's stuff all around. There's, I mean, he's describing what it's like in the belly. For some of you, that would be treacherous. In fact, uh, other translations, the New King James translation in uh, Jonah chapter 2 says, 
uh, that he, he says that this is basically my shield. I'm praying to you out of shield. Sheol, sheol in, the, in the original language means it could mean translated hell. Complete and utter darkness for three days. Some of you may be saying that, that would be it for me. Or it's translated into death. Jonah is saying, look, this is my deathbed. I am in, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die. Anybody claustrophobic? Wrapped, wrapped in seaweed. Wrapped in seaweed around your head. Could you, you're in complete darkness. There's stuff floating around and you can't move for three days and three nights. Some of you had that snuggy blanket. That's what I'm talking about. You're like, in the fish. There's no getting out of this. You're wrapped up. Wrapped up. Any weak swimmers? How many of you are fears of drowning? Like drowning is a real fear that you have. Like, I can go out anyway, but not drowning. So much so you don't even swim. Or you, at least you got to be able to touch, at least. Listen, for Jonah, there, there isn't a win here. This is a lose-lose situation. Even if you and I or Jonah's in the belly of this, even if we had an option to get out, let's just look at the options to get out. Even if there was a way for Jonah to get out of the belly of the fish, what's going to happen? First of all, he's in this large fish that, who knows, it could dive thousands of feet in the water. So even if the, somehow he gets out of the fish, he's going to be thousands of feet below water, and he has to get up. He has to get up to the top. He's got to get up to air. And he's all wrapped up in seaweed. How is he going to swim up when he's all wrapped up? But even if miraculously he could get out, how can you swim with one breath up thousands of feet Drowning is, a bit, is, is one of his options. It's not a good option. So even if he got out, he stopped. even if miraculously he could get out of the seaweed, get to the top, he'd pop his, he'd pop it. think about it, if he's thousands of feet, hey, how would you know where the top is? You'd be down, dark. You wouldn't know where up is up and down is down. It happens in airplanes too. You just don't know where you are. But even if he could get to the get to the top, and he could get some air. Now you're in the middle of the ocean. How's he going to get to land? How's he going to get to land? So Jonah's options are drown or drown. <laughs> That's really his only options. So really, this great fish is a miracle. This great fish didn't save him. God saved him, but he used the Uber to do it. <laughs> you know, Jonah chapter 2 is all about <clears throat> prayer, and I want to just share some nuggets about prayer, because for many of us, and I'll just be honest with you, prayer, especially early on, now I've, I've matured in my relationship with God to understand the value of having communion with God. Okay, prayer is a conversation. It's, don't make it something it's not. Some of us, see, when we say prayer, you're thinking of like some weird chants or thing or, you know, if you've ever been to like the Middle East, you hear the, the, the chant, you make it something that it's not. Simply, prayer is this. We're talking to, except for we're talking to the Holy God. We're talking to the Lord. Amen. And so, I want to give you some nuggets in prayer through Jonah, uh, how John, Jonah began to pray in the belly of the fish. Now, I do want to say Jonah was in a really tough spot, and maybe you are too. Jonah was literally either he did die or he was about to die, but he's literally in the belly of the fish. He, his life is, it, it says, my, my soul is going away from me. I am in Sheol. I'm, I'm at my deathbed, and that's where I am. Now understand, he's in the belly of a fish. Why? Because he sinned. So there are consequences. But also understand, God didn't abandon him. God pursued him. Even in our wrong, God is pursuing us. 
Even in our mess, God is pursuing us. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So realize, recognize, maybe you're in a hard spot today. Maybe you're running from God like Jonah is. God hasn't stopped pursuing you. When God created us, male and female, Adam and Eve, when he created us, he put us in the garden, and the Bible says that God came and met with them in the cool of day and night every day. Do you know God doesn't stop showing up even though you do? Every day God shows up. Every day God was in that garden. Every, even after Adam sinned and Eve sinned, even after they sinned and they hid themselves, guess what? They didn't come find God. God found them. And that's the truth all through the Bible. This is why Jesus came, because he loves you. He's pursuing you. Whether you're in a fish, whether you're in a mess, whether you're on the mountaintop, whether you're in the valley, look, it doesn't matter to God. All he wants to be is with you. He wants to draw near to you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to be in his presence. We make this all mystical and strange and weird, but the reality is God wants a relationship with you, period. That's it. God wants you to talk to him. God wants to talk to you. That's prayer, period. Sure, we can grow in our relationship just like you can grow in a relationship with your spouse and your kids and your friends and all of those things. But prayer isn't the last thing you do. Now, for Jonah, like he is in his last days, but listen, he's a prophet of God. He's prayed many times. Prayer is powerful. This is the living God that you're talking to. And the reality is Jonah couldn't get himself out of the situation even if, he, even if he tried or even if he could. He couldn't get himself out. And that may be where you, be. you may be today. You can't get out. You can't figure it out. You can't come up with an answer. You can't come up with a solution. Guess what? It's a good time to be in the presence of God. It's a great time. And so I just want to give you some nuggets of wisdom through prayer that I've learned, I want, that Jonah is speaking because prayer is the cornerstone. This is the cornerstone of your relationship with God. And for many of us, and look, I'm just going to speak, and I, I want you to feel, hopefully this helps you. Hopefully this will relieve you. I thought prayer was telling God what his job description is. I thought prayer was, God, you need to answer these things in my life in this way, please. In Jesus' name, amen. That's not prayer. I'm making myself the Lord. I'm not trusting the Lord. Sure, I, I know Jesus died for me. I enjoyed the benefits of that. But really, I want to control my own life, and I want him to bless it, and I put his name at the end of it. That's not prayer. Prayer is not a list of demands that God has to answer, or I won't worship you. That's not Prayer. And I'm not trying to be hard because I was that guy. I, I've been that guy. Sometimes I slip into my old ways and I say things and then I have to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I really, I wasn't asking. I was complaining. So I want you to know this is a relationship. We mess it up. The good thing is he never messes up on his side. Amen. And he'll pursue you. He won't stop. He's not going to leave you and forsake you and never talk to you again. That's what we do. That's not what he does. He's batting 1,000, and we're barely under 200, aren't we? That's why it's a fishy tale, but we have a faithful God. So this morning, I wanted to, I'll have the ushers help me. I'm going to just sit in a chair. Is that okay? All right, I'm going to sit in a chair. Not because I just want to sit in a chair, but many times when we pray, it doesn't look like this, does it? It doesn't. So for me, the, and I'm sorry, I stole this from the ladies in the nursing mom's room, so sorry, moms. <laughs> On Mother's Day, I steal your chair. I'll, forgive me. But the reason why I got this chair is because um, <clears throat> at my house, we, uh, we just got into our house, and we have a sunroom, and we have rocking chairs just like this. And we have two rocking chairs, this, this like swing, you know, those porch swings, and uh, and this incredible edible egg chair, the egg chair. You guys know what those are? Like you can fit three people in there. It's awesome. I think I can sit my whole family and the dog in the egg chair. It's great. And so, uh, but we like to sit out there. And, um, and honestly, I, I like to sit out there. Uh, and this is 
you know, this is a new rhythm for me because this is all new for us. But, um, you know, when you spend time with the Lord, it can be wherever you want. But for me, this is great. I like to sit in the sunroom and we get to see the sunrise, the sunset. It's beautiful. We get to see out the backyard and see all these things. And, uh, you know, the kids love it. We love it. You know, they all say they, they like the sunroom. But, you know, we get to have conversation not only as a family, but Jen and I as a spouse with the Lord. And so, you know, just as, it's just a neat new place, but important place. And whether it's in the sunroom or in my car or at the office or wherever I am, the, the, uh, the importance isn't the place. The importance is the God I worship, the person. And so I just want to encourage you when, we, when you think about prayer, this is, this is the best meeting that you can attend. It really is. It's the best conversation that you can have in the day. And it doesn't matter what part of the day. You know, some, uh, you know I've, I've been in messages or series and prayer series where you got to pray at six in the morning for two hours in your closet. Man, I would never make those meetings ever. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. It might be right for somebody else, but you've got to figure out what works for you. The important part is, is that you find a value in talking to the Lord. And so this morning, I just wanted to share some really five things that we see and Jonah, as he prays in, in Jonah chapter 2. Um, but let me just say this, and if you're taking notes, you can take this down or take a shot of the screen if you want. But I, I want you to remember this. It's better to be in the presence of God. Let me say it again. It's better to be in the presence of God than not in his presence and have a resolution to whatever crisis you're going through. It's better to be in the presence of God and whatever crisis or situation, then not be in the presence, even if you have a resolution. You see, God has such a bigger perspective and understanding than we do. And for Jonah, he used a fish to save him. Now, I can pretty much promise you that wasn't Jonah's prayer. As they're throwing him into the water, He's not saying, dear Lord, just send a fish to swallow me whole, wrap me up in seaweed, put me in the dark for three days, and then please, Lord, vomit me on dry land. Please, God. That wasn't his prayer. In fact, you're going to see as we read his prayer, while he had concerns and he was in that moment and he was talking about being in the belly of the fish and he was expressing how he felt, there was a moment where he came to just worship. He came to a place where he just said, God, you're you. You're my Lord and you're my God. And that's when things began to change for Jonah. You see, being in the presence of God is, it's so valuable. And really it's hard to even put a word to it, but to be talking to the God that made you Christianity, following Jesus, honestly, and maybe you're here today and you never understood religions, this is the only religion, and I say religion lightly because we have a bad understanding of what religion is. Following Jesus is the only relationship, and it separates itself from every other religion, every other faith that's out there. And I'm not trying to be harsh, but these are all false gods but I want you to understand something. All other religions say God is up here and we're down here and you can't know God. You can't have communion with God. You can't be in the same atmosphere with it. God is in heaven where it's perfect and beautiful and sinless and there's no death and there's, there's, there's no time. It's eternal. It's, he's all powerful. But you can't have relationship with him. But you can work and earn to God and try to gain his approval. You can do things. You can reincarnate many times. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you'll make it. You see, all these other religions lack relationship with the living God. Jesus is the only one, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the only one as God himself that left heaven and came to earth and dwelt among us. He's the only one that came and lived on earth, that he created to live with people that he created to have relationship with. Not only to have relationship with, but to fix what we messed up. 
You see, following Jesus doesn't mean that God's here and I'm there. It means that heaven has now come to you and now dwells inside of you and lives in you. And when you pray, every single time you pray, you are entering the holiest of places that's ever been created. In the Old Testament, they call it the Holy of Holies, and only one person can go in there once a year. And they would take all the burdens and all the sins and all the concerns of the nation, they would take it to the living God. And when Jesus came to earth, he tore the veil, and instead of dwelling in a place, in a temple, in the, holy, in the center of a building, now your body is the temple. And now the Holy Spirit, God himself, dwells in you. And now every time you pray, you enter that holy of holies. And you get to speak to the living God that knows everything about everything. Prayer is beautiful and it's powerful. It's not the last thing you do. Now, I certainly understand if we don't understand it, sometimes it's we only pray out of need or necessity or out of, out of emergency. Here's five things that Jonah taught us through his prayer. First, it's distance changing. What I mean by that is what was Jonah doing? He was trying to get away from God. His plan was, I'm going to go to South Spain because that's the f- furthest place that he could think of in the moment to get away from Jerusalem, the place the Holy of Holies was where, Jeru- where the Lord dwelt. That I'm going to get as far away from the presence of God that I can. Little did he know that God would swallow him in a fish and take him thousands of feet deep in the sea and he's probably further distance-wise than he was at Tarshish. But yet in one moment, when you pray, the presence of God can meet you wherever you are, regardless of how far you are, regardless of what your decisions are, whatever, regardless of what your sin is or your mistake is. In one second, millisecond, however you want to describe it, you can be in the presence of God. So it takes distance, and God meets you right where you are instantly. In this place, today, right now, you can pray and And God will be right there. He's here now. A lot of times we say things like, God, come down. If you're a believer, he's already here. I understand what you're trying to say. But sometimes we're disconnecting the communion that we have every single moment of every day. Our words do matter. I just want you to understand that prayer isn't something like you have to wait for the download. Remember the old AOL? You remember the old 56K flash? (laughs) Instantly. I know the old people are like, you know, the, the younger kids are like, what's he talking about? Never mind. You don't want that day. Trust me. <laughs> it's distance changing. Instantly, you can be with God. Instantly. Second, it's verbal processing. Jonah's talking to the Lord and he's saying, look, this is where I'm at. I'm in the belly of the fish. The waves are crashing over me. There's seaweed wrapped around me. Can I just say we live in a culture in a day where our verbal processing is not healthy. We post, we tweet, we snap pictures of the good, right? And we hide the bad. When we're in pain, we hide it. When things are good, we display it. We let everybody know things are good. How are you doing? I'm good, but you're destroyed inside. For Jonah... And, and I know he, he's in the pit. He's in literally his last moments of his life. He begins to talk to God. He begins to process. And he begins to say, here's where I'm at. You see, this is what I love about prayer. And I don't care whether it's Jonah or Jesus or David or Solomon or you or me. The reality is you can talk to, about, to God about anything. Even if, it's, even if you're thinking, oh, sorry, is not clear. Even if you're messed up in your head, it's okay. God wants to talk to you. Jesus said it this way. Full of anxiety. Now, anxiety wasn't ruling his life, but he was anxious. In fact, so much so that he was sweating blood. And he said, God, if you can do anything, let this cup pass. Change the situation is what he's saying. But I love how he shifted his thinking like Jonah shifts his thinking. But not my will but yours be done. 
And this is what Jonah's doing in his prayer. Look, I'm in this mire, I'm in this mess, I'm in the pit, I'm in Sheol. But in verse 6, he changes his tone. He says, but Lord my God, I will worship you. You see, we don't worship. Here's where we get a little bit messed up, and I just want to help you when, you when you're processing verbally. We don't wait for God to deliver us, then we worship. You have to learn to worship regardless of your deliverance. Otherwise, when God delivers you, you're not going to worship after either. That's why Jesus said to many others, uh, there was a conversation between heaven and hell, and it was a family member, and they said, well, God saved my brothers and saved my sisters. And they said, I've done miracles in front of them, they still won't believe. You see, you got to get to a place where you can worship regardless if it's a good day, a bad day, if you're in Sheol or you're in the middle. Regardless, I'm going to worship you because you're God. Not because I'm trying to get something from you. I'm worshiping you because you're the Lord. Amen. And because you made me, you are who you are, and I'm going to worship you regardless if I like the situation. Yeah, you know, what did the psalmist say? The psalmist said this, though I live in the shadow of the valley of death, can I just tell you, you're going to go through stuff? Why? Not because God desired us to go through bad things, but that's the reality of sin. That's why Jonah's in the fish, right? Did God, would God have desired Jonah to obey? Absolutely. He would rather God, uh, he would rather Jonah obey than send a fish to swallow him whole. You see, a lot of times we, we like to play the victim, and that was me, maybe this is you. It's your fault, it's your fault, it's his fault. I love that Jonah said, no, it's my fault. Get better at saying it's my fault. Many times in our prayers, we blame God, who's never made a mistake ever. God, it's your fault. If God didn't send that fish, Jonah would have died. Now, he may not have liked it, and you may not like it, but this is God pursuing you, and his answer is always better than yours. You know, I heard this uh, about prayer one time, and I, I thought I would share this. Um, so there's distance changing, there's verbal processing where you just are talking, sharing your burdens, sharing your cares to the Lord, and third, there's a transfer of burden that happens when we pray. Now, I just want to tell you, when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught, he taught us to honor the Lord first. Hallowed be thy name. I worship you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth. Why did he say on earth as it is in heaven? Because it's different. Because it's different. Heaven doesn't have the same reality as we do on earth. That's why we have to worship God first. God, we honor you. We exalt you. I'm thankful that you're God and I'm not. And then Jesus went into, in the middle of, of the Lord's Prayer, about your daily bread and your needs and things that's going on in your life. But he started with worshiping God. You always got to start with, it's always about worship. It's always about making God first, honoring him, exalting him. See, that's your prayer life. Look, I'm not trying to make it complex. All you simply got to do is, with your own words, honor the Lord. You don't have to say hallowed if that's not the way you speak, but use a word that means your heart, that you're expressing what you truly feel about the Lord. So we worship, and then there's this transfer that happens. Jimmy Evans said it this way, and I love it, and I can't believe it's 1208. You guys mind staying? It's Mother's Day. Jimmy Evans said it this way, and I love it. I love the way, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, there's this one time where I got really hard, hard, hard time in my life, and I think we've all been at those different places. But uh, anyway, here's the question uh, his friend or his pastor asked him, and I'll, and I'll just ask you to ask yourself. Here's what he asked him. How's your prayer life? And here's what Jimmy said. My prayer life is great. I, I talk to God regularly. I, I tell him what's going on, and I, I'm very open about how I feel and what's happening in my life, and I'm not happy with the situation. We've talked to it in great detail for, for a long period of time. And here's what the pastor said. How's your anxiety? And Jimmy said, well, it's the worst it's ever been. I'm not sleeping. I had to go see a doctor. I'm not doing well. And here was his response. 
You're not praying, you're complaining. Now, I don't know about you, but I've complained a lot to God before. And it's not that God doesn't want you to talk. Please hear me. He's not saying stop complaining, but really a lot of times we're complaining to God, but we're not asking for his resolution. We're not asking for his answers, are we? We're just complaining and saying, God, you need to fix it this way, please. You need to do this. You need to answer this. You need to give me this job. You need to fix my marriage. You need to fix my kids. But we never get into the point to say, your will be done, not mine. I've complained a lot. And so the pastor said, uh, you're not praying, you're complaining. And then he looked at Jimmy and said, now how's your prayer life? And Jimmy said it this way, and I love it. Well, I guess my prayer life's not good. I guess I complained a lot, though. I complained a lot to the Lord. And you may be saying, well, how can he say that? Because there's no anxiety in heaven. If you're talking to the Lord and there's not a transfer happening, right? My peace I give you. La, 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 la. And then you leave anxious. You leave depressed. No, no, no. In the presence of God, there's a transfer. There's a transfer that happens. There's a peace that's given. Now, it may take some time. It may, look, God can heal it in a snap. He could change the situation in an instant. But sometimes you go through stuff. But you got to realize that God is with you. God is with you. He's going through it with you. He never said, I'm taking all the burden away. He said, no, no, my burden and my yoke is easy. From God's perspective, what he's going to transfer to you is easy. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to go through it. But be encouraged that you have a God that's overcome the world and he's with you. He lives inside of you. The holy of holies is in you. Prayer is so powerful. Hebrews, uh, so there's a transfer. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16 says it this way. It says, seeing that you have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, being very clear, this is Jesus we're talking about. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, in every way, tempted just as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That's prayer, my friends. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may what? Transfer. What are we transferring? That you can obtain mercy, that you can find grace. When? In a time of need. That's what happens when we pray. Maybe you need mercy today. Maybe you need grace today. Maybe you're in a time of need. None of us, let's be honest, none of us are in the belly of a fish. But maybe you're in the belly of something, some situation. You have a God that's here to help you. See, the presence of God is better that we're in the presence of God than we're not in the presence of God. Look, if you're in a crisis, it's amazing that you can be in the presence of God, that you can come boldly to the throne of grace, understand that Jesus doesn't know. It's not that he doesn't understand. A lot of times, this is the way we look at God. God doesn't understand. He doesn't know. Really? He can't understand how that felt when they betrayed me, how that felt when they lied to me, when they deceived to me. He, he doesn't understand how bad it hurts. He took whips and crowns of thorns on his head. He knows. He understands. He was betrayed more than you, my friends. He was crucified on the cross because of us, because we betrayed him. He died. He died a terrible death. He understands loss. He understands grieving. He understands hurt. He understands pain. He understands betrayal. He understands lying. He understands, can I, the list can go on and on. Every temptation and every sin, he gets them all. Yet he never sinned. Who do you want helping you? That's the question I want to ask you. Who do you want helping you? That person on the Facebook feed? That person that's sending you a, a chat or a conversation, or that friend that you're sitting down with that's, that's telling you to get away from God? 
Do you want a human that's helping you that's fallen, that's sinned? We've all fallen short. I'm not trying to be hard on them. I'm saying, do you want wisdom from somebody who's fallen? Or do you want wisdom that has faced every temptation and never sinned? Come boldly to the throne of grace. That's what prayer is. Anytime. The belly of a fish, your car, your work, your marriage, your kids, whatever it is. You've got a great God and you can talk to him at any moment. Do not make prayer so complicated that you have to be in a certain place. It has to be a certain time. You can only do it then. I can only pray in church. No, you can pray anywhere, especially in the church. My, church, my house is a house of... That's right. I know this should be a series, but prayer has only two outlooks. We have a lot of labels, don't we? We like to label things. We like to put people in boxes, right? You're economically this, your race is this, your, your education is this, your job is this, your, you know, your middle, high, the poverty level. We do all these labels, but you know how God looks at things? You're either a worshiper or you're an idolater. That's it. There's only two. You either worship or you worship an idolatry. But let me just say, God made us. He made you. He made us male and female in what? He created us in what? In his image. He created you to do what? Worship. Worship. You are going to worship something. You'll either worship the living God or you're going to worship something else. That's what we call idolatry. You know, idolatry in its form, in its essence, the motivation behind it looks like God, right? We want to worship Something, we're going to worship something, but is it going to be you? Is it going to be your wealth? Is it going to be your status? Is it going to be a relationship? Is it going to be a tree, a cow? We're going to worship something. Is it going to be Jesus Christ or is it not going to be? And don't be hard on yourself. We've all, been, we've all worshiped in idolatry, all of us. Look, I, I wanted to the wealth, I wanted the fame, I wanted the stature, I wanted the position, and I worshiped that until I was empty inside and realized that's not it. Jonah was lost in prejudice. I don't want to give you a spoiler alert because we're not to Jonah chapter four yet, but Jonah chapter four, after God saves Nineveh, you know what he says? Why are you saving these people? These people? How many of you said that about these people? I don't know who these people are, but, you know, we can have sin and be prejudiced against situations, circumstances, people, nations, cities. These people? Look, Jonah had idolatry too. All I'm saying is, is we have to look at our hearts. That's why I love this song that we're going to end with and we just saying, search my heart, God. Is my worship, is it to you? Is it to me? Jonah chapter 2, verse 8 10 says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. It's not that God's not given mercy. We're forsaking his mercy because we're not worshiping him. Right? God gives mercy, grace, and help in time of need, but you got to worship him. You got to talk to him. You got to have pray to him. So if you're praying to a piece of wood, which I never understood that, right? I'd read the Old Testament. I'm like, how do you worship a piece of wood? How do you make a golden calf and then worship what you just made? But then I realized in my own sinful heart, that's what I do. I worship things that are made by people instead of worshiping the living God who made everything. Call it a piece of wood, call it a calf, call it wealth, call it status, call it, you, you know, I want to be popular, call it whatever you want. Those are all made things by human beings. And all those human beings and things that are made are made by the living God. When are we going to realize that, look, worshiping, look, idolatry, worshiping something other than God is a fabrication. It's a counterfeit. It's a deception. It's a lie. Because the enemy got thrown out of heaven for what? I want to be worshipped. I want to be like God, which means I want people to worship me. And here we are as human beings on earth saying, I want to worship me. I want to worship what I want. I want to worship my pleasures and my desires. And we lose sight of the one that made us. We lose sight of the living God. I love verse 10. Actually, verse 9 and 10 of this. 
at some point in your life, and this is where I've grown in my life, at some point in my life, in your life, in my life, you're going to get to a place that says, I'm going to worship no matter what. I'm going to talk to God no matter what. Belly of a fish. Maybe I'm at the highest place that's just amazing and I'm loving what God's doing in my life or I'm right in the middle and I don't know what's going on. What, you know, I'm not sure what's next. Jonah said it, but I will sacrifice to you. With the voice of thanksgiving. Imagine that, giving thanksgiving in the belly of a fish. That's what you do when you praise. That's what you do when you worship. God, I am thankful for you. I may be in a terrible situation, but you're a good God. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is not of the fish, it's of the Lord. Jesus died to save you. When you come to a place where you give Jesus everything, I'm going to worship you with my words. I'm going to worship you with my actions. And God, whatever you bless me with, I'm going to worship. And I know if I say I'm going to worship you, worship you with my wallet, you're all going to turn me off. But let me just be honest with you. It's all the same to God. Worship is worship. I can't separate how God's blessed me from how he saved me. It's all his. And I love what Jonah said. God, I'll worship you with my with my mouth, I'm going to worship you with my life. And God, whatever I have is yours. And then he said, salvation, which by the way hadn't happened. Jesus hadn't died for the world yet. He said, salvation, another, another pointing to Christ, the Messiah. That's who he's talking to. Salvation is of the Lord. And instantly the fish vomited him out on the dry land. Are you ready to pray? It's powerful. I just wanted to end. I want you to be in the presence of the Lord. This is a house of prayer. You've come, I hope, to meet with the living God. Is that right? You've come to be in his presence. You've come to talk to the living God. Look, it, that's, not, that's not limited only to Sunday morning, but there is power when we gather together. You can leave here and pray. You can leave here and be in the presence of God. But there's some value. There's something special God does. That's why he says, don't negate this right here. Don't you negate meeting together. And if you're online, look, I understand you're online. But let me just tell you, there's an important aspect of you being with brothers and sisters, being in the house of the Lord. But whether you're at home or you're in this room, I just want you to stand to your feet. Let's enter the presence of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for prayer. You died so we can have communion with you, so we can worship you, so we can hear from you. What we broke, what we separated, what we ruined, what we sinned and broke our relationship with you, Jesus, you came to restore. You are the Lord. You have saved us. And if you haven't been saved, now's the day. Today's the day. You just tell Jesus, Lord, I have sinned. I have run like Jonah, but I'm, I realize now you're the Lord. And I want to be a follower. I want to follow you. Lord, we end this moment in your presence with being in your presence. And so, Lord, we just elevate you. Hallowed be the, your name. We exalt you. We express our love to you. We just tell you how great you are because you are great. And whether I tell you or not, something's going to tell you. So I choose in my own voice to give thanksgiving, to give my life, to give my words, to give my actions, to give every part of me, my resources, everything, it's all yours. I choose to worship you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Look, we want to pray with you as well. We'll have altar, so altar teams, come on up. If you need prayer, maybe you don't know what to say. Maybe you're still uncomfortable. We want to pray with you, but you could pray right there in your seats, but let me just encourage you. Look, you're in the presence of God. Worship him with your own words. Worship him to the song, but make it your own. You're in his presence. Exalt him, celebrate him, worship him. And if you need prayer for anything at all, we'll be here to pray with you. Moms, happy Mother's Day. So we're gonna end in the presence of God. We're gonna end with prayer. As soon as it's over, uh, Todd will dismiss you here in a minute. But let's worship God together.